Hey guys, welcome back to A Minute with Drew, and today I'm going to rant a little bit about the drum machine versus live drums debate. So, as a massive fan of 80s synth music, and to be fair, really any kind of synth based music, I'm a huge fan of a solid 808 just pounding at the bottom end of any song. Anytime I'm in a bad mood, I just put on a song with that type of bass drum and I'm instantly in a better mood. And it doesn't have to be this complicated computer drum beat anyway, just a simple 4 on the floor is enough to give my mood a complete 180. Like any 4 on the floor synth pop tune from the 80s just puts me in a naturally good mood. But that's not to say I prefer electronic drums though. A skilled drummer behind a set can really work some magic. I know this sounds really cliche, but a live drummer really adds a good human feel to a song a lot of times. There are also some spontaneous moments that human drummers can make that a computer really can't do. If you were to ask me which kind I prefer, I would say as long as it's in the right setting and played well, either style would put me in a mood to sing or dance or whatever. Well, I hope you enjoy the upcoming interview with a fantastic drummer in the amazing band that is Dianthus. See you later. Hey guys, welcome back to the Gear Guys podcast. It's Drew again. And today on the show, we have the two lovely ladies from the band Dianthus. They're identical twin sisters. We have Jackie and Jessica Perry. How are you both doing? Hello, we're, we're doing, doing awesome. Doing good. We're actually fraternal. <laughs> oh. <laughs> A lot of people think we are identical, though. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, interesting. A new, a new fact I learned. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, like you said, you guys are fraternal, but you guys do look a lot alike. So I bet you guys have a lot of stories of getting mistaken for each other. Do you have like a really funny story of you guys getting mistaken for each other? Oh, well, we've gotten a couple of funny stories, like when we were in school and stuff, like we'd like to switch classes, like the last day of school. <laughs> So yes. I know this, right? Yeah. But you know, playing in the bands, like if I carry drumsticks, then people know exactly who I am. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Guitar yeah. yeah, you can't switch spots on stage. Yeah, true, play. true, true. <laughs> <laughs> um, now you also you also commonly with twins have a lot of stories of them having seemingly you know telepathic communication or stuff like that. Um, do you guys feel like you have stuff like that? And how does that affect you guys when you're playing a show or you're writing a song? Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. We kind of like read each other, you know, if we're, um, you know, most of the time it's the two of us in the room jamming or writing. We're mm-hmm. always kind of um, feeding ideas off of each other. And, you yeah. know, um, if Jessica comes up with a drum part or, you know, a drum riff, I'd like to say, um, I kind of, you know, we kind of mirror that. Mm-hmm. So it kind of comes through in our music a lot, you know, that telepathic kind of sound. Right. So yeah, that definitely exists. Yeah. Oh, cool. That's cool. That's cool. Um, now let's get into the music a little bit. You were both brought up like originally as classical piano players, correct? Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, how did that originally come about? Was it like parents forcing you into it or did you guys do that on, of your own volition? Um, pretty much it was, yeah, our own intuition, um, the both of us, like um, it was very intriguing and um, it's kind of funny how it started. Um, we had neighbors who were moving out and they couldn't bring their piano. So um, mm-hmm. they were so kind enough to actually let us have it. So we we brought the piano in our house. Um, really nice. And mm-hmm. um, it was Sherman Clay, I believe. Yeah. But um, we yeah, but anymore. We, mm-hmm. Yeah, we had to eventually move on and sell it. But yeah, that's how we got started, though. Mm-hmm. Oh, we wow, both interesting. Mm-hmm. interesting. Now, what caused you guys to move from piano to guitar? Like you were saying, you had to sell that piano. Is that what caused you guys to move to guitar and drums or did that sort of happen before? Um, oh yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, we mm-hmm. still have a piano, a classical piano to access. But um, as far as jumping into the rock side, um, we did start a rock school um, when we were 14, I think. Middle school. Oh, wow. so middle yeah. school age, yeah. And once we did that, you know, the rock genre really captivated us. Mm-hmm. And it challenged us a little bit more, you know, rhythmically too. Um, because mm-hmm. you know, the feel for the drums is totally different from the soft classical piano. Yeah. So yeah, it was very challenging. So that's what kind of um drove us to pursue it. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. really interesting. And yeah, a lot of your songs are seem really difficult rhythmically. So oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I like to, to push myself with yeah, exploring different um time signatures and stuff. So yeah. Oh, yeah, that's great. That's great. Okay, so you guys originally did classical piano and it moved and it moved into your current music, which is all, you know, prog metal and stuff like that. How did that come about? 
yeah um pretty much it was um an intuition with drumming um yeah because we were covering a lot of our favorite bands um that were classic mm -hmm. rock so they had more of the four four kind of feel but then um you know I just wanted to challenge myself and um you know I had a metronome next to me I would bump it up to five four six eight stuff like that so um I found a really cool palette of um grooves to explore and then mm -hmm. Jackie caught on to it really quickly too yeah I, I think even listening to bands like Tool for example you know just that band and even Rush yeah, yeah we heard Rush before Tool so they had you know those melodies going on and kind of you know it was a good intro to those yeah. progressive genres it was yeah Rush has some great you know different time signature prog kind of stuff you know Definitely. It throws off the listener for sure, but I like Oh, yeah. It. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's what I feel a lot of your music does too. Like sometimes I'm listening to it and I'm trying to follow along, and sometimes it kind of throws me off, and I'm like, okay, that's what they were going for. Exactly. Love that. So, like you were talking about Russian Tool, what other bands inspire you guys? Uh, lots of modern metal bands. Modern ones. For sure. And definitely Metallica, um, Gojira. Gojira. We just caught their new music today. I think they released an album today, actually. Oh, wow. But yeah, Gojira. Um, Light Wish, two female fronted bands um, in this moment. Yeah. So um, it's, a, it's a good mix of modern and stuff like that. Yeah, so. even some a little bit of Children of Bodom with those oh. synthesizers going on. Yeah, mm -hmm. very melodic. Yeah, love them. Cool. cool, really cool. Now, what originally caused you guys to start working together on writing music? Oh, um, well, we've always been together. It was natural. <laughs> it was a pretty natural. Oh, yeah. Thing. And yeah. we just, we've always had each other and we happen to like the same thing, which is music. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was a pretty organic kind of thing. Okay. So you guys sort of just had that bond from the beginning that you kind of knew, okay, let's work together on this music thing. Right. Yeah. yeah Cause guitar, drums, you have your melody, you have your groove. So it, yeah. yeah, it was perfect to start from there. Cool. Now when writing a song, what's the first thing you guys come up with? Is it the riffs? Is it the lyrics? Does it sort of depend on the song? Um, yeah, I think 90% of the time it's the music first. That's how it's kind of, um, it's been most of the time. So, yeah. you know, sometimes it's a drum part. That part we can't really predict, but yeah, it's right. obviously music first, either guitars first or drums first. Yeah. yeah. I think for like the heavier stuff that we do, um, not so much the ballads, it usually starts with drums for like the heavier mm -hmm. um, prog proggy kind of stuff and it directs mm -hmm. everything else. But um, yeah, we have ballads and you know softer songs and that starts with piano and guitar mm -hmm. yeah so. oh yeah i love your guys about i love all of your stuff honestly like your, some of your ballads are so pretty are so good um now your one album that i'm actually really addicted to worth living for was produced by jinx of black belt brides could you tell me how that came about and how that experience was for you it was yeah it, it was pretty cool um we um got connected with jinx through um patrick fogarty he um, was our pretty much first manager um, with the band. Mm -hmm. And he was the video director for Black Girl Brides videos. Um, he did the Legacy and Lives in Ten. So um, we're huge fans of the band and we still are. So um, it was pretty natural for him to hook us up with Jink. So. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's really cool. You have any fun stories of being in the, in, of, in the studio recording that album? Oh yeah, <laughs> definitely for guitars. Yeah, Jinx was, you know, he was so kind to, you know, offer all of his equipment for us to, you know, play around with and kind of dial in our sound. So I think mm -hmm. just recording the guitars for me, that was so much fun. And he gave me some of his signature picks too. Oh, to wow. use the studio. I still use those as well. Yeah. But um, even him tracking some violin on our, our ballads was pretty cool too. Yeah. So just hearing his, you know, his side too. Oh, yeah. wow. He even tracked some strings on your guys' songs? Yeah. He yeah. did. It was um, the unveiling and sincerity. So sincerity. yeah, classical. So yeah, mm -hmm. uh, sincerity. I love. Oh, oh so good, so good. It was a very I, listen, huh? Yeah, um, it's a very vulnerable song. So. Oh yeah, definitely. Literally, the first time I heard it, I literally started crying. I'm not gonna oh. lie, driving into work, just sobbing. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh. <laughs> <That's amazing>. yeah. <laughs> so. And now last year, you guys released the single Realms. Talk to me about sort of the inspiration for that song and how that song kind of came about. Yeah, um, I think at the time um, we took a long break from writing. So I think we took maybe like half a year off because we were playing so many shows. Mm -hmm. And um, during that time that we had off from writing, we were listening to so many different bands like, 
you know, I would be listening to um, like Steve Vai, Passion Warfare, and then I would listen to like, you know, the sugar <laughs> the next second or, you know, yeah. like something really heavy, but um, obviously we won't scream. But, um, you know, they kind of tied into our, our sound for that song because you hear mm -hmm. lots of different nuances going on. Um, um, right, right. Yeah. right. Um, also, too, um, around 2018, like, um, I remember the Queen movie came out, so Bohemian Rhapsody. And um, that band, like, it really, like, reignited, like, our passion for, um, you know, exploring different sounds. Yeah. And, you know, creating kind of a ground kind of sound. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, that was a theme for the song. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, you also have a album of the same name coming out. What's the projected date of that to come out? Um, so, yeah, it's still tentative because um, we do have to finish about three more tracks. But um, we're hoping maybe around um, summertime, I believe. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this year for sure. Oh, great, great. How is that process going, recording all the, that album? Really, pretty fun. really good. Yeah, we only have like a couple more songs, but everything's written. And, um, you know, with COVID, we've had so much time to just make these songs sound the best they can. Mm -hmm. And so. working with um, producer Steve Evitz, too. He's done a lot of our favorite bands, um, Films Your Escape Plan and What's Your Baby. So he really knows how to, you know, get that aggression from bands. So mm -hmm. he's been really helpful. Oh, that's great. Now, what are your plans for after COVID sort of passes for promoting this album when it does come out? Um, definitely playing live shows. That's like the first thing in my mind. Mm -hmm. Playing lots of live shows, getting out of California. Um, yeah, getting some new fans to hear our music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I hear you guys are planning on touring for this album. Do you know where you're going to be going for that tour or what you're going to be doing? Um, it's definitely going to be outside of the U.S. <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh, we won't say exactly where yet, but um, we're definitely excited about it. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, great. Now, when you go play live, what do you picture your stage show sort of looking like? Are you into lots of smoke and pyro? Or are you into like mm -hmm. cooler stuff? What do you picture your live stage show to look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, definitely some smoke machines going on, you know, the dark lighting. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of creating like a mood, um, you know, making like some props, mm -hmm. <laughs> mysterious kind of ambiance going on. So, yeah, mm -hmm. we love the gothic side. So like a moon that stage, you know, that'd be cool. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. Right. And hey, hey, if you're looking for a live synth player in New Jersey and California, not that bad a drive, you know. So if you need anything, let me know. <laughs> I don't yeah. mind driving cross country 5,000 miles. You know, it's not bad. <laughs> also, you guys are designing with a comic book that's going to come out as well, correct? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're really stoked about that. And, you know, like the whole um, realm, if you will, of comics, mm -hmm. um, very similar to like progressive music. So it's really cool. Mm -hmm. cool. Now, how did, that, how did that all come about? And what is the comic going to be about? If you can share a little bit. Um, yeah, well, um, one of um, well, Deco's creatives, Sean, mm -hmm. um, he's been working with us on that, and it was kind of his idea that he brought up to us, and we were totally on board with it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we know comics, and um, you know, people that read comics and people that listen to music, it just goes hand in hand. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're really excited for that opportunity. Yeah. That's great. So, and you guys are both teachers as well, correct? Um, yes, we do teach yeah. music outside of the band. Okay, that's really cool. Now, being a teacher can also be a little bit difficult. So how do you guys juggle your teaching and your writing performing as well as all the business aspects that go into a music career? Yeah, um, we definitely have to, you know, stay organized with, you know, different hours of the day. We have, you know, the rocker schedule, we sleep in a bit. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, when we teach music, it's in the afternoon. So um, I'm happy it's that way because our energy is... Um, pretty sharp at that point and then we like to unwind with some metal at the end of that <laughs> so, yeah it's it's pretty cool we, we plan out lessons and stuff and um music theory is a priority as well mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. well, yeah you kind of can't play what you guys are playing without a little bit of music theory you know exactly. mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. so um also you mentioned a lot through this interview working with deco entertainment and the people there how do you like being a deco artist we love it. You know, mm -hmm. they're so generous to us. They treat us, you know, really well. And, you know, all these opportunities that have come up, come up for us, is it's all thanks to them. You know, we mm -hmm. have a great team there. You know, we're really excited and honored to be working with them too. And yes. if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be talking to you. So <laughs> really thank you. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. And if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be talking to you guys. You right. know, one of my favorite new bands out now. 
I mean, <laughs> honest. Connect here, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Um, so we're going to take a little bit of a break right now, and when we come back, we'll be able to talk both to Jessica and to Jackie about the gear they use and their preferred specs and preferences and all that stuff like that. Now, as a keyboard player, it'll give me a little bit of an education too. So make sure to stick around to hear all that after a word from our sponsor. Here at Novell Global, we are the industry leader in fine jewelry craftsmanship. Our handcrafted and custom designed rings, meticulously crafted from the finest precious metals, are perfect for all of your needs, whether that be for an engagement, a wedding, or for everyday fashion. All of our rings are made in America and have been since 1988. guys, welcome back to the podcast. Right now I have Jessica, the drummer of Dianthus, to talk about some of the gear she's using. Awesome. Cool. Can't wait okay. To hear it. Yeah. Okay. So what is the current main drum set you're using for this album? Um, so the main um, kit I'm using, um, it's a Tama Star Classic Babinga Birchwood kit. So. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I, that's, that's pretty. Now, are there certain specs about this set that you like more than some of others you've used? Yeah, um, I definitely love the extra floor tom. So um, yeah, there's the extra floor tom, it's a 14 by 16. So um, it's really cool to kind of expand my palette of sounds through that, so it's really fun. And um, it also has like shallow dimensions. So um, yeah, the sound is um, pretty clear and crisp. Well, that's really cool. Definitely great to sort of cut through the mix to hear the drum stuff. Yeah, exactly. Now, you talked about adding an extra tom. Do you tend to lean towards a simpler drum set or do you like having all the cymbals, all the toms, you know, two bass drums, however? Oh, yeah, good question there. Um, You know, I'm somewhere in the middle. So, yeah, I won't have like a small cocktail kit, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> I like to have a standard um, kit, five or six piece. Um, I'm definitely more of a um, toms kind of player. I like having lots of toms, but um, yeah, you can't go wrong with um, adding lots of symbols too. True. So. You can't go wrong with the more stuff you have. <laughs> yeah. Dr drums is the very rare cases where more is more. <laughs> yeah. Right. If I had space in my house here, yeah, probably start seeing two kick drums or something. <laughs> but yeah. That's funny. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's the first thing you look for when you're trying out a new drum or a new cymbal? Like you said, you recently bought a new snare drum, I believe. Yeah. What's the what's the first thing you look for when you're trying out something new like that? Yeah, um, I look for something that's definitely got that projection. And, um, you know, when it comes to snares too, I was, you know, looking at something that really cuts through because, you know, we have lots of heavy guitars and you know, it has kind of like a muddy feel sometimes with lots of bass. So it, it's good for the drums to sing through that. So yeah, definitely the volume level is big. Oh yeah, definitely. And a lot, some, a lot of the technical stuff you're doing, people really want to hear. So it's cool that it cuts through the mix like that. Right. Yeah. Because um, if I didn't have toms or snares that project really well, you know, I'd have to use a lot more force with, you know, my wrist too. So yeah. And with all that technical stuff, sometimes, you know, harder makes you slow down a little bit. Mm -hmm. So it's cool to have a lighter touch so you can speed through some of those, again, really technical, really difficult things you do in the songs that just come out so well. Oh, thank you. Yeah. You definitely have to have, you know, that technique and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, last thing for you, if you could design your ideal drum set, snare, cymbals, whatever, what would that look like? And what would the kind of specs be? Ooh. Um, it would be kind of close to the one I have now. Um, I definitely would like the shells to be like Babinga. You know, I look up to Mario de Plantier of Gojira. So he inspires me to have that, you know, exotic sound with drums. Mm -hmm. So definitely a Babinga kit. And, um, you know, I love Remo. So Remo heads all the way. 
and you know just an elegant look so black or silver kind of finish yeah okay cool that's really cool a nice little gothic you know look to it black dark that's really cool Mm -hmm. thank you okay so like you were saying you recently bought a snare can you just walk me through that and why you picked out this specific drum Yes, um, so I was on a long quest for um, a brass snare um, because I used a brass snare in the studio um, and I just really loved the projection and the musicality of it. So um, I got myself a 5x14 um, World Max brass snare. That's really nice. Yeah, it's got a really gorgeous kind of um, engraving here and it's Victorian too. So um, it looks just as good as it sounds. It also has a Remo coded ambassador head. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty much came ready to play. It's all tuned up. So really excited about it. Great. That looks gorgeous. If it looks half as good as it plays, I want to hear oh, it. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be hearing it in lots of our material real soon. Okay. And we'll be right back with talking to Jackie about her guitar setup. We're back with Jackie, the guitar player of Dianthus. Let's talk about your gear for a little bit. Now, what's the main guitar that you're using currently? Um, currently, I use my Schecter Hellraiser Hybrid. Got it right here. Um, this guitar I've had for such a long time, actually. I got it in 2014, so it still feels brand new to me. Um, but yeah, this is the main guitar I use. But I also use Charvel guitars as well. So um, I actually just got this one <laughs> recently, too. But I love these because they're super light and they got EMG pickups in them too. So, yeah. I love the little inlays between the frets on that one. Well, thank you. Yeah, let me bring that up one more time. It's got the keystone inlays. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's gorgeous. Thank you. Okay, now are there certain specs of these guitars that you like more than others you've used? Um, As far as um, guitars, I think I've mainly stuck with these two brands. But um, one thing I really like about um, the Charvel guitar is that it's super light. You know, it's easy to play um, long sets with this one. Um, I think it's only like seven pounds. So it's like super light. But um, the Schecter is a little bit heavier. And, um, you know, they do say that heavier guitars have a better sound. But um, I don't know. It's it's kind of, you know, it's it's an opinion based thing. But yeah, I really like the Schecter. This one's got... um, the 57 and 66 EMG pickups. Mm -hmm. So this is just a good all around guitar too. But yep, those are the main ones I use. Oh, cool. Now, are you a big pedal player? And if so, what kind of pedals are you using currently? Yeah, um, yeah, good question. I actually, um, I'm in the process of kind of downsizing my pedal board just to make it um, more tour friendly. So um, yeah, the pedals I use, I, I try to keep it simple. So I use a volume pedal, um, a delay pedal by Boss, and I'm trying to think of what else I use. I use ISP Decimator to cut through all that gain, you know, get rid of all that extra noise. So yeah, I keep it pretty simple. Oh, cool, cool. So you're not one to experiment with weird, not common pedals. You more stick to common distortions and delays and stuff like that? Yeah, I, I, I try to keep it kind of simple. If anything, I like to just use delays on certain solos. But yeah, I think when you keep it simple, it makes you focus more on the music more. So yeah, yeah, try to keep it simple. That's cool. And now you're also the singer for Dianthus. So what do you do to kind of keep your voice at the ready when you're performing live? Yeah, every show I try to warm up. So, you know, um, my voice is, um, you know, a voice is a very delicate thing. So you want to make sure you eat the right foods, you know, you don't, you know, have a lot of dairy. So yeah, I try to keep it simple. I'll try to have peppermint tea before shows and same with Jessica as well. So yeah, warming up and drinking plenty of water. Yeah. That's really great. That's really great. Now, same thing I asked Jessica earlier, if you could design your ideal guitar, what would that look like? And what would kind of the specs be? Yeah, um, I would, if I had that opportunity, that'd be super cool. Um, I would, I would try to design a guitar that's light, but it still sounds really nice. Like the tone wouldn't be compromised. Um, EMG pickups for sure. I'm endorsed by them. So very good sound. Um, six strings. I haven't really tried, you know, any more than that, but six strings is just enough for me. 
but yeah, six strings, um, a compound radius. So something that's, you know, neck through as well mm -hmm. would be really great. Makes it easy to get up on those higher registers there. But yeah, pretty simple, not too many knobs. <laughs> Any so specific just, kind of finish or color or anything like that? Oh, um, probably I would say solid black. I need more solid black guitars. <laughs> in my yeah, gotta gotta yeah. stick with the whole Gothic black stuff. Yeah, maybe some cool inlays too. Like I really like this Schecter too because it's got like the Gothic cross mm -hmm. inlay there. But yeah, maybe just certain details, but black guitar. All right, cool. cool. Okay, so you guys are also working with Novell to design a jewelry line, is that correct? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. correct. Now, how is that process going? Oh, it's Lots pretty exciting. Yeah, um, we, we're very into jewelry. You know, we love how it accents the black clothing and stuff. So um, it's been a real treat to dive into the concept of our album and how to translate it into wearable pieces. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well, that's really cool. That's really cool. Well, again, Novell sponsors this show. So we we're so excited to be seeing your guys' pieces soon. And with that, I think we're running up against the clock a little bit. So thank you guys for taking time out of your busy schedule for this interview today. Really appreciate it. Of course. Honestly, it was kind of fanboying this entire interview, but hope I didn't show it too much. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and we hope you guys listening and watching enjoyed this interview. And we will see you in the next one. Bye. Hey, guys. Welcome back to another episode of What Is That Sound? Today, inspired by this episode's interview with Dianthus, I'm going to show you guys how to get a nice little synth string sound that works great with really any genre, from metal to hip-hop to electronic to rock, really anything. Also, if you combine this patch with any normal string patch, it comes up with this fantastic combined patch for all different kinds of pad work and really any song you can come up with. So. Let's get into it. First, let's make sure we have our initial patch up. Fantastic. Then we're going to go over to the oscillator section. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn on two sawtooth waves, make sure they're playing. Then we're going to tune them roughly 5 to 10 cents apart. I like to put one negative 5 cents and one to positive 5 cents. Gets a nice little chorus thing going on. Next, we're going to move to the filter section. Now for a string sound, I like to put the filter roughly between halfway and three quarters, and then raise the resonance just a little bit to get a little pop to the sound. Let's see. Maybe put the filter a little bit higher there. And now, we're going to move on to the envelope generator section. Now just like the jump patch from the last episode, we're going to put the delay on zero, the sustain all the way up, and the release all the way down. Except what we're going to do to get a little bit of a stringy kind of sound, is we're going to put the attack to roughly one quarter, so we get this kind of thing. Now for the other envelope generator. We're going to do the same thing with no delay, maximum sustain, and no release, except this time we're going to put the attack to roughly the same that the amp envelope is on. And then we're going to add a little bit of intensity, and this is what it sounds like. Maybe a little bit more intensity. Cool. And we end up with a sound that's like this. Of course, just the plain synth sound is a little bit bland, so what I'm going to do, turn on a couple effects, and we'll hear what it sounds like. Okay, the effects are now turned on, let's see what this sounds like. Ooh, 
that sounds sweet. Now the song that inspired me to make this patch is Dianthus's Interlude. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to combine this patch with some regular string sounds, and we'll see how it works in context of Dianthus's Interlude. I'll be right back. Hope you guys enjoyed today's episode, and I'll see you later.